Thanks, everybody. Um, so what is a land bank? It, it, it's a pretty simple concept, and uh, there's a lot of questions right now. We're, uh, we're starting to get momentum. Cook County land bank's getting momentum, and, and throughout Illinois, there's a lot of kind of activity and, and, and inquiry into, into land banking. So what, what is a land bank? It's pretty straightforward. A land bank is basically a public agency of some sort. It could be based in a city, a county, a collection of cities, but it's really a, uh, an agency that's really dedicated to one thing, and that's taking underutilized property, um, abandoned property, distressed property, and putting that back into productive use. And that may be done in a variety of different ways and a variety of different types of property. We'll talk about that uh, a little later, but our land bank uh, works on basically everything from residential properties, single family homes, things like that, to commercial properties, industrial, and then large redevelopment sites, even brownfields and things like that. So a land bank really is going to be tailored to the community it's working in. It's going to be tied in with that local uh, uh, municipality or county or both. And the way we've set ours up and the way uh, Cook County is set up are a little bit different, but I'll get through that in, in, in a little bit. Um, so you can see up here, there's a lot of other land banks throughout the country, um, particularly uh, Michigan and Ohio have very strong land, land banks. They also have state enabling legislation for their land banks, which gives them special powers and also gives them a stream of revenue. Unfortunately, we don't have that in Illinois, so there is no stream of revenue. Uh, we've gotten money through grants and private funding and other things, but that's a big challenge for us here. We can do a lot of the things that land banks need to do, so that's things like clearing back taxes, clearing title, holding properties, acquisitions, those kind of things. But uh, one of the improvements that needs to happen kind of in the future for land banks to be successful down the line is that there's a dedicated revenue source from the state or from somewhere. We haven't figured that out yet, but you know that's, that's one of our big challenges. Um, so uh, a couple things about land banks. There's, there's not really a size that works great or anything like that. There's big ones. There's little ones. There's ones, one, the land bank in Detroit owns 85,000 properties. We own about 100 properties. So, you know, that you can have them of all kind of sizes, shapes. They all do different things. Some land banks focus completely on residential properties. Some do a mix of properties. Um, so I won't read through our mission statement, but basically the, the important point in how we're, we're uh, structured is that we do things consistent with local government plans and priorities. So the way our land bank is structured, because there is not enabling legislation, is we are structured through an intergovernmental agreement between our municipalities. Right now we have 16 municipalities that are members, so they all sign that agreement with us. Uh, the Cook County Land Bank is a county uh, agency, and they are created through a county action. So they're a little different, and Cook County is a special case because they have home rule authority in the county, and that gives their land bank basically the, the, the abilities it needs to have. It's very difficult for a land bank to operate without home rule authority. With our, uh, with our structure, our home rule authority towns allow us to do uh, work in our non-home rule authority towns the same way because it transfers through this inter intergovernmental agreement. So when we started, one of the things we needed to do was figure out how we do that. And uh, so we came up with the intergovernmental concept and then just have added uh, municipalities as their been interests. So we started with three, we have 16. We don't really have any limits or anything other than uh, uh, as constructed now, we cover South Cook and Will County. We can expand to Kankakee with a board action. So we would have to change our bylaws, but that's something we've already talked about doing and, and can do. So on our end, that would be the kind of technical thing we would have to do. But we view this whole area as kind of uh, 
our service area. We don't see other land banks really having the ability to form uh, successfully because of the funding issues. So as people start thinking about it, we want to at least encourage them to talk to us because we can at least get you through a lot of the legal and other work um, that we've kind of already been through. And then if you want to join us, great. If you want to kind of do your own thing, great. You know, but, you know, go off of what we've done and what Cook County's done because we're, you know, all willing to kind of share, uh, uh, you know, our experience so far. So uh, what can a land bank do? Uh, basically, let me, I guess, walk through a couple things on this slide. The, the South Suburban Land Bank is intergovernmental. Um, each of our uh, municipalities gets a board member onto our board, so they appoint a board member. When we do transactions, so when we acquire properties or dispose of properties, we have to get approval of that local person before it even would go to our board, or if it's something that doesn't need board approval, we still need that local person to approve of that uh, transaction. So everything we do is filtered through that local municipality, and if it's something that needs to go to our board, the first question they ask is, do we have local support? If the answer is no, that's it. We, you know, we, we don't do it. Um, if, if it's a property the, the, the city is not interested in us pursuing, we don't pursue it. it it's all done really at the direction of, of the municipality we're working in. So that's kind of how we operate um, internally. Um, with, with our members, there's no fees. There's no investment. If you want to invest in a property or a project, that's great. We can work that out. Um, but there is no fee to do our normal thing. We will use our own funding to, to work on properties we can. That being said, that's limited. So, you know, the more opportunities there are to work with, you know, the city or whoever to do more, we would always look for that. But there's no requirement for the city to put in anything for us. Um, there's also no liability. We get our own insurance. We're an independent agency. The city does not have to step in. There's no uh, uh, risk or liability that transfers to the city at all. So it's completely separate, and I think that helps keeping things off of your books and also liability-wise and, and things like that. So that's something to think about, that there's an extra kind of layer of protection that the city would get. Um, we can hold property, we can assemble property, so uh, we can sell property. Uh, one of the things we've, we've been very active in doing in a lot of our communities which have metro stations is assembling property around the metro stations to, to be able to aggregate enough property to go to a developer and have a sizable enough uh, project that's kind of gift wrapped and ready to go for them. So that's kind of one of the strategies we would, we would uh, uh, we, we would work with, with you guys to figure out where what makes sense, where are the key target areas that may be the main street coming in, that may be you know around the hospital, that may be around downtown. There may be multiple areas that you know would be areas to, to focus on, but we want to focus on big impact, you know, where we can you know do things quickly. You know, there's always long term projects. We work on that too. But, you know, when, when we're looking at stuff, um, we want to really focus on the most important things, you know, visually, um, economically, that, that kind of thing. So when I, when I come out here last week, I drove around a little bit and noticed a couple of the schools drove by. There's vacant houses across the street from elementary schools. I would go after those very quickly and try and get those to be torn down and made into nice grass lots and, and, you know, do something, you know, and use our resources for things like that. Those are important things that we would, you know, look to focus on. Um, so just a few kind of ideas of what we do. Um, we've gotten in the last, uh, since, since we've started, we started in late 2013. We didn't get funding until 2014, so we've had about a year almost a year and a half of real operations. In that time, we've been able to raise several million dollars in additional grants, uh, private bank money, donation money. 
we've had over 100 properties, most of which are donated to us. Some of those have real value to them. We got a very large parcel that's worth about three quarters of a million dollars, and it was donated to us. Um, so we're able to get things very easily and quickly. There's a lot of uh, a lot of tools we have. Um, so when we when we look at at acquiring properties or projects, there's a bunch of different places we can get those from, and we've gotten them from literally all of them. We can get them from private sellers. We can get them as bank donations from municipalities we've gotten properties, uh, open market purchases, tax sales, you name it, we've probably done it or have it in our uh, pipeline now. So we work basically with everybody and there's, there's a lot of reasons for a lot of different folks to wanna work with us because of what we can do and get something out of their hands that they can't move. So there's a lot of properties, particularly Southern Cook County, that have really horrendous back taxes owed on them, so much so that the back taxes are way higher than the property's value will ever be. And those properties are stuck. They can't go anywhere, they can't do anything, nobody can sell them. So we can step in as in using basically municipal authority, but do a deed in lieu or something like that where we can make an arrangement with a uh, cooperative owner to be able to wipe out the back taxes acquire the property and then be able to make it marketable because those those title encumbrances have been cleared out and now you have something marketable that isn't encumbered by taxes or something else that that is holding it back so we've been doing that with a lot of commercial property in in cook county and it's been very successful we've got some new uh, companies moving into to projects that uh, we freed up for them and creating jobs and all that kind of other good stuff along with it. Um, so we see that as, as something we'll be doing a lot of in, in, the, in the coming years. Um, disposition, it, the underlying part is locally determined. So when we sell something, like I said, it, it's gotta go through our board process and it's gotta go through uh, that local representative. So if we're selling, whether it's a house or an industrial building, we have to have local uh, support to be able to sell it. So if it's if it's a use the city doesn't want, and I come and say, you know, we've got this this buyer, but it's not something that lines up. You're going to tell me no, and then we don't do it. So it, it's not you 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 basically have a veto power in essence on on anything that's you know bought or sold in essence. Um, no, let me just back up. Uh, the bottom here, land banks operate uh, very differently throughout the country. S many of them wholesale properties, so properties come in and they basically get them out the door as quickly as possible um, with the idea that someone else will take care of them and fix them up. That works well in some places. We've taken a little different approach. Our board has felt that we don't really want to do that. We would rather improve those properties, sell them at a higher price so the market comps and everything is, is up higher. And that also will kind of take out the margin for the investors on those properties where they, you know, they could do it quicker and cheaper than we would, so they wouldn't probably buy one from us, but a home buyer might. And we have a little bit less of a profit motive than a, a, a developer would. So we can make a deal. We can wait for a home buyer to go through financing. If it takes six months or something, that's not a big deal for us. So there's projects like that that we, you know, are working on on the single family side that um, we want to be able to do. But we use local contractors. We bid everything out. We try and keep the jobs, you know, where the work is. And... Uh, um, uh, we've got local contractors that will take care of our vacant houses, lawn cutting, you know, you name it. We've got a we've got a local business that's doing that. Um, so here I won't go through this, but funding we've got most of our funding through the attorney general's uh, foreclosure settlement. That's very flexible money for us, and allows us to do. Uh, basically operational things, but also use it as acquisition and rehab money. So the basic business plan we have is we have a lot of in inventory that we will fix up and sell and then recoup that money and recirculate those funds to do the same thing over and over. So basically we want to just keep doing this. 
when uh, we have longer term projects, we've got to figure out the funding a little bit differently because they're going to be sitting a while and we won't get the money back. But those, you know, each one we've got to kind of work through and make sure we can hold on to it long enough and, and figure out a plan for that property down the line. So we've got short term projects, we've got medium, and we've got long term. Um, so here's our member communities. Um, We've got bigger ones, smaller ones, kind of everything in between. A um, couple examples of, of properties. So we've got a lot of single family homes, condos. Uh, the property in Oak Forest on the end is a, is a TOD related property that would actually get demolished and that whole area redeveloped with housing and we're, we're helping the city of Oak Forest uh, accumulate property in, in that uh, area, assemble it so we can, uh, we can go out to the development community and get a, a larger transaction. Um, can land banking be effective? We don't have a long history. Like I said, we've had funding for about a year and I can't tell you we've got a great track record. You know, going back 10 years, we just haven't been around that long. But land banking in other places has been very successful. And it, uh, a lot of it is attributed to the fact that there's eyes on these properties. So these distressed properties, if they didn't go through a land bank, eventually they're going to you know, go through some system and get into somebody's hands. Generally, that is a worse outcome than when a land bank is involved because of the monitoring and the level of involvement and basically the eyes that are on that, uh, on that project. So um, we think, you know, with what we're doing, it, you know, it'll be successful. We've had lots of interest um, on our, our uh, structure throughout the state. We've gone and presented in Rockford. Uh, we've talked to the folks in Danville. There's people in Peoria that are interested in land banking. So it's something that I think is, you know, statewide, you know, a lot of people are looking at it because they've seen us be successful. They've seen us be able to raise money and get money. And with the whole idea being that the land bank is doing things so the city doesn't have to, essentially. So we're, we're landlords, we are property owners. Cities are very bad at that when it comes to things that aren't public property like a library or something like that. They don't want single family houses, they don't want vacant lots. They're not very good at taking care of them. That's what basically the land bank's for. That's all we do. So there's efficiencies when we buy things. There's efficiencies when we bid out work for landscaping or something like that. Um, we have, you know, dedicated attorneys and accountants that, you know, help us through all this. So when we do an acquisition, it's a much more streamlined process and usually very simple. Whereas if you guys want to, you know, acquire a house, I'm sure it's a pretty complicated process for the city to go through just to acquire something if you were going to, say, tear it down or something. Sure. Well, a couple, a couple ways. So, so the first way really would be the board process. So depending on what it is with us, different, pro different price levels have different involvement. So if it's, if it's a donation property or a property that's, say, around $20,000 or less, I have the ability to approve that with that local board rep, and that's it. It doesn't have to go through our board process. Our board meets monthly, but for properties like that, we can just approve it and start working on it. It, it can. So we have the ability to, to, to hold exempt. We would look at each one of them basically case by case. If it's a single family home that we think we're going to turn over quickly, we'll, we'll probably just pay the taxes and, and hope we sell it fast and not really worry about it. If it's something longer term, we will probably want to exempt it um, if we're holding something for a long time. Yep. 
Yeah, yeah, and we have some some other tools with with that. We've worked through a couple things in Cook County, and I I think that it'd be applicable here too. But in in Cook County, um, they've got like a scavenger sale kind of system called the no cash bid, and it takes about two years to get a property. We've worked out like an over the counter process that cuts that down to about eight months, and we basically it, it's something that. It, it qualifies the same way, so it's it's like a one year of forfeited taxes and a year, at least a year of delinquent or forfeited taxes. We have the ability to basically say we'd like that property, and then just wait for that to happen, and and we can we can get it that way. With with something with with uh, a lot of taxes, uh, back taxes, we would really aggressively pursue a deed and lieu situation. So cities have the ability very few ways to clear back taxes, but one of the ways is through foreclosure or a deed in lieu of foreclosure or a deed in lieu of payment. When we have uh, cooperative sellers, they're very anxious to get us properties to get out of that because it's just accumulating on them. And it's a real, real easy process. It's almost really simply like a mechanics lien where we go out, perform a service that they've agreed to, say we go change the locks. Yeah, yeah, that that's within current state law. So one of the one of the things that we would hope to change is make that less cumbersome with with some state legislation for land banks. But since that's not in place, we've got to use the rules that are in place, and that's one of them. But we've set it up where it's a real kind of straightforward process with template documents that we've already run through the state's attorney and they've cleared it so we can just basically say here's these documents sign this and then paper goes back and forth and and you know we can get a, a, a deed to a property and and then wipe out those back taxes very cheaply and and pretty quickly Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so uh, we look at everything very project by project. Um, I haven't figured out any better way to do it, quite frankly, because they're all different. Each town is different where they have different priorities. So one of the things we do is we sit down and we ask, you know, what are your priorities? In some of our towns, like in Oak Forest, we are focused on their commercial corridors and their metro station, and that's it. We don't do any residential work there. We don't really do any other work there. Uh, you know, those markets are, are pretty, pretty good and functioning. So we don't need to, to, to even get involved. But we go to the town and really ask them, where do you want us to focus on, knowing that we don't have unlimited resources. So what are the things you know, we can you know, work on first? But, but what, I, what we found in, in the last year is that, in general, we're able to do a lot where we don't have to pay for anything because of that ability to get someone out of those back taxes or get them out of a situation where maybe the city's not willing to take that risk of that property, but we are. We're set up for that. So it may be something where, you know, there's general agreement that that's what we should go after, and there may not be a big financial commitment. We, quite frankly, have not spent a lot of money on acquisitions at all for all the properties we've had. We've, we've uh, been fortunate to get a lot of grant money, but I have not used a lot, um, so we've got most of it still. So we've been very efficient, but that learning process has been that there are so many of these things out there that we don't have to, you know, necessarily pay for. We're doing something else that's adding value and getting somebody out of a situation they can't get out of. Um, so we haven't had to commit a lot of money. And the way I've kind of put it with with all the different communities, because 
you know, even if we got, you know, $10 million in new funding tomorrow, that's still not enough for everyone. So I, I really look to everybody to, you know, be strategic on their end when they look at where we should be focusing. Um, so we're not, you know, kind of scattered, you know, let's. No. Yep. Yes, yeah, we we turn down way more than we take in. And generally, on the residential side, we don't have a lot of demolition money. I, you guys do your own demolitions here with public works. Most of our towns don't do that, so it's a big expense. Um, so we've got a little bit of dedicated demolition money, but we don't we don't budget for you know hundreds of demolitions we don't really have that issue anyway but that's other land banks really focus on that quite greatly we do, we don't we don't really need to but um uh generally we're able to do a lot of what we need to do without a lot of funding for acquisitions for properties and and when we spread it out between the communities, I kind of tell them, you know, if everybody is active and engaged with us, everybody will get something. Timing is always different because different properties and different things come up at different times and nobody has control over that. But if you're engaged with us and working with us, you know, stuff will come up and we eventually will get to somebody that maybe we don't have property in now. In, in the last year, we've basically gotten properties in, in every one of the communities, maybe except one or two. Yes. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so each of them, some, pro some, some towns were just doing residential work in. Some, it's the commercial or, or industrial or something else. So, yeah, it's very targeted for, for each of them. Yeah, yeah, yep, and and what we what we tend to do, and we've got just because of the the housing crisis, there's so many rentals and things that have happened in in a lot of our areas that you know have really soured people to investors, and and uh, we don't want to discourage that. What we want to do is encourage developers with capacity that are good um, or nonprofit. I mean, it it could be for profit or nonprofit. But we really want to be mindful of screening who we're dealing with. And if they're good, if they can take two or ten, you know, we're going to figure it out and try and get them, you know, yeah, to, to yeah. I mean, if, if there's someone that can say, I'll take this one, and if this one works out, I'll take these five, we'd be happy to, to set up an agreement to, to make that happen. And, and we'll be monitoring them throughout the process to make sure that happens. We're not very investor oriented because we need to underwrite everybody that's buying from us essentially because we have uh, we have to be mindful and we have obligations to uh, some of the the funders we have and some of the banks we get property from. They require us to report on who we've sold a house to and what the outcome is. Um, so we've you know we've got to do a lot of screening. But we want to work with good developers. We're working on a couple big projects with a couple of big, capable developers now. Um, so yes, I mean the answer is absolutely. We'd want to work with. I don't know if there's a, like a Habitat for Humanity affiliate here. We'd want to work with them. Any active nonprofits. We'd really want to get properties to someone who can do something good with them. And if they can't do it we would want to rehab it um, ourselves so that's you know our kind of our strategy we don't in in a lot of our areas there's not a real active uh, not nonprofit development uh, group of firms so we're taking on that role a little bit I, I kind of envision ourselves doing um, and uh, but if we can recruit anybody else to to make it happen better we want to do that We yeah yeah we 
we'll, we kind of can do it a couple ways. So the bigger sites, like if we get something that is kind of beyond one house, we'd probably do an RFP in conjunction with the city. So we're looking at that, especially with our metro sites, that we would, yeah, yeah. So so we yeah we would do that. Yep. So. Uh, um, um, oh, I'm sorry. You had a question over here. No, that's a great question. Um, you retain all of your your control. We don't we don't get involved in zoning. We don't get involved in in development approval or permitting or anything like that. That all remains with with the city. So what what we feel our job is to do is to first of all screen who's coming in with a project, and then we would talk to our local rep and say. Here's what their concept is. They want to build, you know, five houses or whatever they want to do. If that person is on board and says, "Yeah, that fits in with our plan," then we would kind of move it to the next step. But they would still come to you for permits. They would still come to you for for zoning or whatever else they they need approvals for. We don't get involved in any of that. And essentially, we're not going to sell that property to that that firm or that individual until they've met whatever uh, requirements the city's going to have on them. So we're not going to just say, oh, yeah, you know, you guys go build, you know, those townhouses, but they haven't even come to the city for, you know, a zoning change or something. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and we would build that into our contract with, with the developer. So, you know, it, they may have, and it may be something where they have, you know, a development agreement with the city also, but for us, the transaction from kind of start to finish, when we first look at it, it's going to come to the local person to see if there's interest. If there is and it moves forward, when we buy it, they're, they're going to be involved because they're going to be notified when we buy it. When we talk to anybody as far as selling it or disposition, they're going to be notified because we need their approval through all of those steps. else we're probably pretty equal I was thinking about that today um, we've got in our inventory we've got roughly about 40 houses that we either own or will own in a couple weeks under contract we've got probably about 40 vacant lots um, that are I guess residential and then the rest of the inventory is all commercial or vacant commercial land, essentially. So in uh, most, I guess, probably all, all of our areas, the, the job generation and the commercial aspect has been critical. A lot of land banks don't focus on that. They focus on, on residential. Our funding is mostly for residential, but We've kind of said that if we don't also address the commercial issues, the residential work will be for naught because it will collapse on itself in a couple years anyway because of the tax base still not being there and people not having jobs. So we've really tried to focus, even though the funding's a little bit more difficult to arrange, a lot on the commercial. So it might be about 50-50 in the time I spend on on things, but the commercial stuff we try and look at as big impactful projects where if we take over this property, can we get a redevelopment to happen? Can, you know, that's either gonna be, you know, new new uh, construction for housing or whatever, but the job's related to that, or it's gonna be a new business facility that's not there or has been abandoned that gets up and reactivated. Um, and then that property's back on the tax rolls and, you know, there's jobs, you know, being created. We, we've got a property in, in Dalton that we're, we're about to 
close on to a, a company. It was a, a property that uh, had been sitting for years and years vacant, probably 50,000 square foot uh, like manufacturing facility. We uh, are taking it through a, a cooperative Dean Lou process to wipe out probably half a million dollars in back taxes and transferring the property then to a company that does wastewater uh, treatment. They pump out uh, uh, culverts and things like that and then bring the, the water to the facility. It gets scrubbed out and then they, they put it back into the, into the main sewer, I guess. But very sophisticated, uh, probably about a million dollars in equipment that they've put into this facility. They're already talking about, there's probably six or seven jobs full time that'll be just created from the start, but it's part of a, a larger parcel and they're already talking expansion that might bring like 60 jobs. So it's a big, big win that the property gets back on the tax rolls. There's you know new investment. There's now jobs created. We'll have a big uh, ribbon cutting with the mayor there and and the company. But those are the kind of projects we like to work on because we know there's kind of an end in sight. And there was a cooperative seller. There was a cooperative buyer. But there was kind of this mess in between that somebody needed to clean up, and the the village of Dalton couldn't do it. They just have no resources to do it themselves at all. So they came to us and said, we've got something we think is workable. Can you guys do this? So it, it uh, also a property we didn't have to pay for. So this is something we'll get all of our expenses paid, plus make a decent fee on it. And then we're done with it. And we've barely done anything, but it's brought in jobs and a million dollars worth of improvements on the facility. So we try to be, you know, very strategic about, you know, things that make a lot of sense. And it's not always, you know, something where you have, you know, instant turnaround, but it may be knocking down that, you know, dilapidated building that's across from something or on the main street that just visually now, you know, gets you to the next level. And then maybe a retailer that wasn't looking at it before now drives by and goes, this looks all right. This looks like a nice area, you know, so. Right. That we we haven't we haven't sold side lots yet. We only have a couple of them. Most of our lots are in a like a subdivision, but uh, that's something a lot of other land banks have done very successfully. And we want to as we kind of build up our lot inventory of infill lots. That's something that's basically going to be automatic for us, that if we take something on, it'll be offered to the neighbors and see if we can sell it as a side lot or something like that. So, so that, that strategy is something that a lot of other folks have, have a long track record. We just don't have that inventory right now, but it's a strategy we've said we've got to do this when we have these. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things we would probably – you know, talk to you guys about is those situations where, you know, you're, you're going to knock something down. Well, let's figure out how we can get title to that. If you knock it down and then we hold it and either maintain it or offer it for sale. So you guys don't have to go through that process, but there's abandonment and other kind of tools that we could work with the city on or it could be assigned to us that we can try and really get title to those properties in addition to knocking them down so then it can be you know disseminated and sold to a, you know a neighbor or a, a park you know a park or you know something like that so that it's it's something that's been very successful though yes right yes yeah. 
it's you know if if somebody's paying the tax on them then you know I, I guess that's a kind of an economic question of you know do you, would you rather just to have them you know being paid and and you might have to cut the grass or whatever um, yeah so yeah I, you know it, it it's you know it, it it's 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 I guess the the way we kind of look at it is is if we take it, will it get back to being productive quicker? You know, th there's a lot of stuff that's going to sit forever if nobody kind of does anything with it. And if you're not getting paid, you know, if those are delinquent with taxes, you know, that's never going to turn around. So, you know, in those cases especially, something's got to happen or that'll happen. You know, th they'll, they'll sit in perpetuity. If somebody's paying tax on it, you know, I guess that's a different story and you may want to keep them paying, you know, and then, you know, maybe you cut the lawn and you could lean it. You can always lean it and get title. You can always lean it, assign a lien to us. We can go after and get title the same, the same way. So we wouldn't want them all, but, you know, there's probably ones that make more sense to take title to than others, you know. No, no, no. We get all our our authority through the municipalities now, so we don't we don't add anything unless you're non home rule, and then we bring that ability to a non home rule area. But um, it's all stuff you can do now. The difference usually is that the cities don't have the resources to do it and don't have the staff that kind of works on things like that. You know, some may, a lot of cities are doing kind of land banking themselves where they're taking care of properties or taking properties in and have a lot of stuff in their inventory. I don't know if you guys have a lot like that you hold on to just kind of by default, but um, um, so, yeah. Yeah. So I mean that Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with that, and I think the residential does tend to take care of itself to some extent because there's plenty of investors and other, you know, people that are in that world that, you know, do rehab houses and turn them over and fix them up and sell them. So that's more active, certainly, than the commercial side of things, which, you know, you, you, you know depending on what it is and what the problem is, there may never be activity, whereas a house is a little bit different, you know, animal, a little easier to deal with. But, yeah, I, you know, it, it, it's all really the, the local preference of what you would want us to, to kind of focus on. We do get a lot of properties on the residential side through different systems. Um, uh, National Community Stabilization Trust, which is a large, like, clearinghouse of, of all the REO properties. So we're in that. We get probably several properties a day to look at through that uh, system. That's, there's a lot there, so I wouldn't kind of dismiss residential because there may be good things that come through that, but we would go, you know, whatever focus you would want us to have, that's what we would concentrate on. I mean, that's, that's you know, like I said, that's what we do with every one of our towns is, you know, you tell us where you want us to work. Yes. We got uh, APP funding uh, for six of our towns. We did a joint application and got APP funding. Um, I think we were the second biggest recipient of that. And then uh, we also got blight uh, money, the newest round for two of our towns. The, yeah, and, and what Ida did is they made an exception for the land banks and considered us and the Cook County Land Bank as the nonprofit partner, even though we're a unit of government. Yes, yes, and that, that's a, that's a good point too. So when we do grants, it's all volunteer. So if if 
we uh, have an opportunity for IDA funding or something, we'll make announcements to all our towns and say if anybody's interested in a joint application, we're happy to put something together. If people want to do it on their own and, and apply individually, many of them do that. Some of them join and, you know, so we don't have any preference. You can do kind of whatever makes sense, but Right, right. The, yeah, yeah, actually both of them. So, so, yeah, so the APP property, that program could pay for demo, but it could also reimburse for mowing and, and board ups and, and tree cutting, things like that. Um, the, the blight reduction, the BPP, um, that's strictly a demolition program, a demolition and hold program, uh, essentially. Um, but they, yeah, Ida made an exception, allowed us to act as the nonprofit, and allowed Cook County Land Bank to act as the nonprofit on their application. So that's what made it work, because that was, nobody could figure it out. We, we didn't have a single nonprofit. Yeah, nobody would even call us back. They were like, you want us to, Take these properties, demolish them, and hold them? No, no. <laughs> yeah, so so uh, we, we think, you know, funding-wise, uh, there's a lot of uh, programs that are competitive enough that when we come in with more of a regional uh, application with a number of communities, we think it's much harder for them to say no to us if we've got, you know, a handful of people at least applying rather than just individually and and the the blight uh, program uh, had some minimum requirements which many of our towns wouldn't have ever been able to meet themselves so that allowed you know some of them to to look at it you know through us um, where they wouldn't have been able to do it individually Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, because generally there's someone you can find. I've at least been my experience. The residential, where you get into the tricky part, is kind of the zombie stuff that, you know, there's a servicer, but, you know, that's, you know, it looks like a Bank of America, but it's actually someone else that's servicing it, and you can't, you know, and they haven't foreclosed because there's taxes or something, so they don't want it, and so there's really no one to take an action. Whereas on the commercial side, it's different because there's usually a person or a firm you can kind of track down that's a little easier to find. And if it's, if it's particularly a bank that owns it, they're so desperate to get rid of it that, you know, they're like, can we meet tomorrow? You know, let's, let's talk right now about it. So um, it's, it's been generally easy on the commercial end. Um, to be able to at least have a conversation and start that. And a lot of the, the commercial owners are, you know, business owners or former business owners and, you know, have, you know, they're, you're, we're able to have an easier conversation with them about the process and what it means. And, you know, many of them will have attorney or something that we can talk to and make it, you know, make it make sense to them. And, and uh, um, but the, the residential, the zombie ones are the ones we have the biggest issue trying to find who owns it, but not, not as much on the commercial side. Yeah, not yet, um, but we're, we're developing and it'll be I guess we could use it commercially and, and residentially, but it's going to be mainly a residential product. And it's basically a deed in escrow where we hold title to the property. The person buying it will have a bunch of things they're agreeing to do. So bringing it up to code, certain investment in the property, fixing certain things, doing it within a certain time frame or something like that. So that'll all be part of that agreement. And then as that is kind of unrolled, they will have a time frame and we will have regular monitoring where if they don't meet certain benchmarks, 
we can basically step right in. They haven't been given title, so we don't have to foreclose on them or do anything like that. We just take the property back and move on to somebody else. We haven't had the problem yet, but as we get more active, it, it'll come up, but we're trying to mitigate that with how we do it and not just giving someone, here's the title, good luck, you know, and then, you know, they don't do anything a year later and the house is crumbling. And then, you know, we're trying to figure out how we go back and, and get it. So we don't want to go through that. So we're setting it up. And that's basically a system that uh, the Cleveland uh, Cuyahoga County Land Bank uses and do, is very successful with and allows them to kind of monitor what is going on without doing it themselves. But they've got, you know, kind of ticklers that, you know, through their software that they know every 30 days they've got to go out and look. They send inspectors out. And then if something doesn't happen, they just basically, you know, you get a couple chances, a couple nasty letters, you haven't done something, the property's going to be taken. Yeah, yeah, kind of. And, and it's, it's set up so there's not a foreclosure. You could, you could, there's a lot of ways we can kind of monitor what happens at the end, but we don't want to have to go through an extensive legal process to get something back. Um, and we don't want to have a process that takes a year or more to get it out of someone's hands if they're not doing what they're supposed to. So this kind of solves that issue because they're not really given title until they've done everything and they've got a certificate of occupancy or something like that. No, not yet. Um, we've got a we've got a slightly contaminated site that we're we're working on, but we don't think it's going to need extensive remediation. But uh, land banks, a lot of other land banks throughout the country, work real closely with EPA and do a lot of brownfields work. So we think, especially in in our region, there's a lot of work to do. So we think we'll do more of that. But uh, we've been uh, working with uh, the folks in the Chicago EPA office and they know I'm basically coming to them saying you need to give us money to be able to do this. So they know that's coming but uh, we haven't gotten into it yet too much but it's something I think we'll get more and more into as as the years go by. So I think you know the answer is not yet but it'll be a pr pretty big component of what we do. We've got a lot of polluted sites in the south suburbs so something you know there there needs there needs to be help in that so our our main funding came from the attorney general's settlement um uh ida we get money from uh we got money from hud we get money from private banks um we've gotten donations from from banks uh, when we first started uh, we started with a HUD grant and a uh, very small HUD grant and were able to bridge a couple months that we didn't have funding from uh, we got money from Chase Foundation that kind of bridged a gap for us um, a lot of times when we get properties donated some of the more aggressive banks will donate cash with the properties um, so we get money that way uh, we also have uh, relationships with several banks that will be providing us basically lines of credit so we can use the money to rehab and kind of fix stuff up and sell it. So we've kind of, you know, we go everywhere. We try, you know, if, if there's any funding out there, we pretty aggressively go after it. Unfortunately, there's not a lot out there right now. But now, with that being said, we're leaning very heavily on the banking community to get them involved because we're taking all their junk, quite frankly. And, you know, there's not a lot of taxpayer money out there that we can use. So let's use bank money and make it make sense for them, but make it make sense for us too, and then use that money to fix stuff up. So if a bank is, you know, wants to give us, you know, some distressed property, great, but let's talk about maybe a line of credit with that or, you know, something else. I heard uh, where we could probably have in the county of Tennessee, Tennessee, but I 
I'm more focused on what would be the tangible, the intangible benefit to the not only the city but the community, the residents that reside here from this program. I think a, a couple things. So, so the, the, the kind of bottom line benefit to the city, I think you could measure economically because it's it's things you probably won't have to then deal with, whether it's a house, you know, you don't have to now deal with, you don't have to cut that lawn because we've taken that over and now we're cutting the lawn and we've sold it to somebody else. So there's there should be something somewhat measurable as far as things that the city would not have to do that we would be doing and paying for through our kind of services. Um, I think from the community standpoint, what I found is you know, most, most of the cities we, we deal with have great plans. There's been extensive planning you know, to do things with revitalization areas, all kinds of things like that, but there's not been a lot of execution of that because of resources. We bring kind of fresh resources into that, and when, you know, in the community, when you see you know, the more important house get knocked down, you know, the one that needs to get knocked down, get knocked down and taken care of, or that commercial property, you know, now that it's getting renovated because now someone else can go in there and start a business or something. I think that's where, you know, kind of the community benefit comes in. They see it, you know, you're not gonna really care if something's, you know, three miles from you, you're not gonna see that visually, but when you see it, you know, up close, and that starts happening, that momentum and that activity, I think is what you know the, the residents themselves really look at because it's it's now the execution of the city plans to do something that the city generally is not going to have resources to do, or maybe they're going to do, but maybe it's just going to take a lot longer. So this is kind of accelerating that process, and I think we actually see this stuff happening. That's you know the biggest sales piece for us. Get a lot of support from the residents because they just now you know we we're working on a property that has been an eyesore or been a problem for a long time and they now see activity and that goes along. I might say that this probably create jobs for local residents. Um, I have potential to do that. Yep. Um, because I think I'm hearing from um, the mayor that they want you to focus on the commercial end of it. So I'm thinking with that that this is their Dakota brand. No, no, I haven't. I haven't. Um, but what I would say about that with the, with the jobs and stuff, we don't have a huge staff. You know, it's myself and one other person. Every, everything else is third party sourced to local contractors, whether that be someone cutting the lawn or someone doing rehab work, or it may be a surveyor that goes out to a property, or, you know, you name it, we are engaging those kind of uh, businesses. So the minute we kind of get involved, we know we have resources to be able to do those things. And then we bid it out locally because we want to use local folks and at least support local jobs when we, you know, we wouldn't want someone from Waukegan coming down here to do a roof, you know, when there's roofers in K and Key that can do that. So we would be very mindful about reaching out to local folks because that's really where the job growth is going to come. It's not going to come from me. It's going to come from those businesses that are now, you know, have more work to do, you know, because of what we've been investing. So, Thank you. So are you guys marketing the properties to sell after you take hold of them? Yeah. Or how yeah. are you doing that? So that, that's uh, done a couple different ways. We've got a kind of an ongoing RFQ for realtors. And so right now we've got about a half a dozen approved realtors that will work on various things basically based on their specialty. So we you know have people that are, you know, location specific or commercial properties or you know condo or whatever. So we try to match the realtor up with the property they're working on. And uh, um, if it's a commercial property we would engage you know, the, kind of the appropriate brokers for something like that. We don't want a residential person working on, you know, investment property or something like that. But we lean heavily on realtor and MLS uh, contacts and, and marketing. And then, depending if, if, if it's a large enough site, we have some other uh, kind of development resources that we might go to and post it on some kind of other 
sites group. Uh, there's a brownfields group we, we deal with that does kind of uh, uh, property hosting. So we'll market it basically any way we can, but very so aggressively. You use local railroad just like you would the other. Yeah. Yeah. So here, I I don't know that any of my realtors would be. Well, I mean, they could certainly work here, but probably don't. So we would want to recruit at least one or two realtors in town here that know the market here because if we're doing a house or if it's commercial, whatever it is, it's, you know, we've got to have that local knowledge of, you know, what values are and, you know, what needs to happen, which, you know, if, if they're not active here, it's not going to be helpful. So, yeah, we, you know, we're going to ask questions. It seems like you're adding a lot of different cases with just two people. How do you handle all of that? On the other communities feeling like they're getting service they need from you. When when is the point where you get to hire more people to handle like another community or yeah. I you know I a couple a couple of ways to answer that I guess. Um, one is we will add staff begrudgingly because of funding. So I don't want to be too top heavy with staff until we get kind of a dedicated, more dedicated funding source. So I'm trying not to and staff, even though we probably more staff now. The good news is I can third party all of that, so like construction wise, I've got four different kind of construction estimator, construction manager, consultants that will take on scope work and monitor projects for us. So essentially that's my you know staff on the construction side. They're focused on only that, they'll work only on that. So we, we address it that way through third parties now. We, we think we'll eventually bring on more staff internally, maybe some construction folks internally. But with you know with the way funding is now, I'm very reluctant to do that. Quite quite honestly, um, I think we've been successful at, at servicing all of our communities. I haven't really had complaints with anybody. Um, of course, they all want us to do more, but. You know, I, you know, even if we had more money and more staff, we can't do everything at once. Um, but I think that being said, we're doing stuff nobody else can do or nobody else is doing, so it's all kind of an added value. And once we kind of get really into full swing where we're selling a lot, rehabbing a lot, and moving a lot of property more quickly, and that's we're building to that point, I think, um, the scale will get much bigger and then we'll be able to do much more in each community at, at the same time. But that's mainly a function of funding because we can't have too much going on and then basically run out of money because we're waiting for a bunch of things to close because we used all our money on, you know, all these projects and, and you know, are waiting for, for it to close so we have more money to kind of work on. So we're trying to be mindful with that in mind, you know, that, that uh, we can't get too much on our plane. But that being said, a lot of you know, a lot of this is sitting on stuff, holding it, kind of arranging deals, and that doesn't take a lot of effort. And we've got good contractors that can take care of properties when they're vacant, things like that. So you know, we think we're handling it, but I would love to have more staff and more money to be able to do it. But we've got to be kind of cautious with what we have, I guess. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Russ. Let's Let's give Russ a round of applause.